This is an interview with Jean Bamberger. It's May 27th, 2005. I'm Forrest Larson in the Lewis Music Library. I'm delighted to have Jean Bamberger for a, an interview. Today is May 27th, 2005. We're in the Lewis Music Library. I'm Forrest Larson. Um, Jean Bamberger is Professor of Music and Urban Education at MIT. <laughs> Um, just to, to start off, um, can you say when you were born and, and, and where and, and all that? All right. <laughs> I'll reveal that. I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was born on February 11th, 1924. Oh. <laughs> there you have it. So I, the interview is in the past. I've not given, actually given the date. Oh, it's just the year. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, tell me about um, some of your, your family roots, your parents and grandparents and all that. Okay. Uh, my, uh, my maternal grandparents came from Romania uh -huh. uh, in uh, probably the 70s or 1870s or 1880s, something like that. Um, and my paternal grandparents came from, I think, Lithuania, but maybe Poland. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure. Did they go to the, was this on the East Coast or, or they, the West well, Coast? Well, interesting. Uh, my father's parents went to New York, uh -huh. uh, Brooklyn. Uh, no, I guess my father was born on Delancey Street in, in Lower Manhattan. Uh-huh. Um, but they came to Minneapolis uh, quite early because my grandfather had asthma and um, the, Minneapolis was supposed to be healthy. So they came to Minneapolis then and my grandfather had a pawn shop in the, in the raunchiest part of town. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my, so my father was born in this country. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's father came here, came to Minneapolis directly, uh, and he came because there was somebody in Minneapolis who was running a butter and egg business and needed young men to um, uh, go in a horse and buggy and travel them around the city to sell, selling, selling the stuff. He came by himself, and then he brought his. I don't think they were married yet, but his then uh, to-be wife, and she proceeded to bring all of her relatives. Um, and he, uh, including, he brought his his father, who was the Reverend Ozias Kulberg, um, one of the, I guess, one of the first rabbis in Minneapolis, oh and a very distinguished gentleman with... Um, spoke many languages, as did my grandfather. Uh, and then my grandfather, uh, my mother's father, uh, began peddling uh, all through that, uh, into North Dakota, and ended up um, buying, uh, creating a, a general store in Hankinson, North Dakota. Uh, and uh, that's where she grew up, my mother. Um, and uh, he had a very successful store, including being the medi medi uh, medium or something between the the farmers in North Dakota and uh, and the and particularly General Mills, the big mm -hmm. uh, big city stuff, uh, because Hankinson was a was a railroad uh, stop. Yeah. So and I used to go and visit them in in North Dakota and the most exciting part was watching the trains particularly the guy who weighed stuff because he had a wooden leg <laughs> and, wow. and, and this huge scale and so we liked to play there but then came the depression and everything went kaflooey he left um, they left Hankinson moved back to Minneapolis and, but they lived in Minneapolis in a big house my mother had seven brothers and sisters and um, so that was that family. The other family uh, was uh, actually that grandfather died when I was quite young, and uh, but his wife, my grandmother, Shapiro, lived 
uh, despite her uh, all of her complaint physical problems and she was an incred she didn't read or write she was illiterate she came to this country when she was 12 and went into a tobacco rolling uh, uh, cigar rolling plant um, and uh, she was just a tremendously powerful and uh, smart woman uh, and all of the progeny look like her. <laughs> all the cousins, everybody, including my grandchildren. <laughs> were there any musicians among those? On my mother's side of the family, there were some fairly crazy uh, uh, people who were, it did, one of them played the organ for the silent movies uh, in the theater in Minneapolis. Uh-huh. Uh, and another one, and I think she did some composing. That family, well, they were entertainers, and they were very funny. So what was the organist's name? Her name was Gert Goldstein. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and she was, uh, the, the whole, that whole family, that whole Goldstein family was, uh, they were very funny and very entertaining and probably somewhat suspect in their in their lives I don't really know uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> that was it there was no other music uh -huh. anywhere certainly not on my father's side of the family wow wow um, how many siblings do you have one brother uh -huh. uh, who became a doctor like my father uh, my mother by the way got a degree in child welfare at the University of Minnesota which was all quite amazing that she um, she insisted on going to the university and uh, continued on had a wonderful nursery school in our house um, and my father was a pediatric cardiologist who uh, did that my brother uh, was a radiologist um, and that's the family that's the immediate family so we're um where did some of your musical interests come from? Your parents probably liked music and... Uh... There wasn't that much music in the house. Um, when I was four, just turning five, uh, my parents, my father went to, my parents went, but my father went to Vienna to specialize in internal medicine after having been a general practitioner. Um, and. My mother went along and they left me and my brother in a boarding school in Connecticut, which was a great trauma. Uh, <laughs> and uh, all I, re I remember a lot of things about it, but one of the things I remember was that there was somebody who, some kid practicing the minuet and G every, every <laughs> morning and I really wanted to play that piece. <laughs> but I had already started taking piano lessons when I was four. Uh, so when I came back, I continued, and somebody decided that I uh, was gifted, or whatever you call it. So from the very beginning, I was getting out of school early and, and being treated like some kind of a specimen of some sort. <laughs> so what was the, do you know why you started playing piano? Or? My mother decided, it was, yeah. and my mother was pushing it. I practiced 15 minutes every morning before I went to school. And when I came back from school, I had to practice again. And she, I think from my studies of prodigies, there was always a person, a father or a mother or a teacher who was on the back of the kid. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and making their life miserable and uh, <laughs> pushing all of that. But uh, it was never a question of, <clears throat> I love to do this. It was just that I had to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did your family go to concerts very often? Yes, I got <clears throat> um, the Minneapolis Symphony, which was quite extraordinary. Metropolis was the conductor. Yeah. Um, and every Friday night there was a symphony concert, and I was be I took I went to those concerts from the time I was very little with my parents. Uh, I don't remember going to any other concerts. But those, that was a regular thing. Mm -hmm. And I still know the kind of literature that was 
I know the uh, symphony literature from those days. Um, no, I mean, I recognize things. Uh, and besides that, Metropolis played a lot of contemporary music, which, of course, the assembled multitudes hated. Um, and then, when I uh, was at the University of Minnesota, the orchestra, the Minneapolis Symphony, uh, rehearsed, uh, the hall where they played and rehearsed was on the campus. So I spent more time going to the rehearsals uh, than in my classes, I think, <laughs> during the first two years. Well, even after that. Wow. So that was, that, that was where I got a really important education, was listening to those rehearsals. Were there any um, piano recitals or anything that you heard as a, as a youngster or chamber music concerts? I don't think I knew what chamber music was. Uh -huh. <laughs> Later on, when Joanna Groudon came and her, her husband, Nikolai, was the principal cellist in the, in the, came to be the principal cellist. And then she, I remember she got me playing with some singers. I thought singers were very silly, but uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but I did that. But I nothing else. I didn't, except of course I went to all of their concerts, the cello piano thing. And I that way I really learned the cello literature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't remember when I was little. I don't. I certainly didn't go to any concerts at all. <laughs> wow. So your f your first teacher, uh, piano teacher, was a neighborhood p um, piano teacher. What was her name? Margaret Carlson. Uh -huh. <laughs> and she was uh, had studied with Jacques Delcroze, uh, which I think had I think that was a big influence because she uh, had all of her piano students. Uh, she would invite them to her house on Saturday mornings, and do Delcroze stuff. And I think that was um, I think that was big important influence mm -hmm. in that whole thing. How long did you study with her? Well, until she died of tuberculosis, oh. probably until I was six or seven. Mm -hmm. Is there any lasting um, thing besides the Delcro's influence that you remember? Well, I don't her? really remember her, except that uh, she wrote a an article with the help of my mother on how to get kids to practice and the whole relationship around practicing and parents mm -hmm. was in Good Housekeeping magazine. Um, and on uh, at the head of the article was a picture is a picture of me um, looking very serious, <laughs> <laughs> which which I have. <laughs> Tell me about some of the other um, teachers you had um, as a youngster. Well, then there was Lavillian Jones who was who took over from Margaret Carlson. Um, she was, you know, the ordinary neighborhood piano teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, but by that time I was being made a fuss over. Um, and I remember when I asked her, why, what's this big fuss? Why are you, why is everybody, why are you doing this? Uh, and she said, um, you've got good hands. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but you know, at that point there were the usual yearly or semi-yearly uh, recitals of all the kids who were taking lessons with her, and uh, and I was always the big star. So that was, and I don't remember <clears throat> anything about her teaching. Uh -huh. Do you remember what you were playing at the time? Well, no, I don't. I don't even remember. I don't remember any exercise books. Um, the Maiden's Wish. I don't know what that is, but that <laughs> comes to mind. It's probably. So know. there's two other teachers that you mentioned to me previously. Um, Johanna Groudon, and you mentioned her just a minute yeah. ago, and then Gabriel Fen Fenyes. Fenyes. Yeah. So tell me, um, when you studied with them, and are, are there some other people we're missing well, too? Well, uh, Fenevis was the great piano teacher in Minneapolis at that point. So when I graduated from Lavillian Jones, I was sent to him. He was Hungarian, um, and I I don't think he was much of a teacher, um, but I do. I think I, it was. I was still studying with him when I played with the um, with the local school orchestra, not 
not the public school, mm -hmm. but uh, there was a music school called the McPhail Music School, which, by the way, David DeVoe taught at. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, they had a little orchestra, a student orchestra, and I think I played a Mozart concerto or something with, with that orchestra when I was... Um, well, I studied with him until Joanna Groudon showed up, fortunately. Um, and then I must have been 13 or 14 when mm -hmm. she appeared. Do you remember which Mozart concerto? No. No. Uh, but I know that when I studied, began studying with her, I that was a whole other order of, of, uh, of magnitude. Uh, she had been a student of Schnabel in Germany. Oh. And... Uh, her husband uh, was the assistant principal cellist in the Berlin Philharmonic. Um, who, and they left, they fled, really, on the day when Hitler came to hear the Berlin Philharmonic and everybody was supposed to, the orchestra was supposed to stand up and say, Heil Hitler, and he refused. And that was the end. They left the next day or something. Uh, and they first went to London, and then they went to New York, um, and finally he got the job in Minneapolis, which was very fortunate for me, um, because then I began to have a really, I began to understand something about musicians and the musical culture, and she really became my kind of uh, substitute mother, uh, they or my substitute parents. I spent a lot of time in their house. I listened to them practicing. I went to all their concerts. Uh, and she was the one who connected me up with Krennic because she she made, uh, she asked, Krennic would come and uh, talk about the music that we were studying. She also uh, got her collected students to play all of the WTC, the Well-Tempered Clavier, um, from beginning to end. Um, I remember playing the B minor one, particularly. Um, so that was, that was the studying of the, those were my piano teachers mm -hmm. until Chicago. Was um, Johanna Grodin, did she also give recitals in the area, solo recitals, and did she have a performing career? She had a big performing career with her husband. They were yeah. an established duo. Mm -hmm. uh, she also played with the Minneapolis Symphony. She played the uh, Mendelssohn Rondo something or other, Brilliant, or, uh -huh. uh, and I think some other, she also played some other concerto, but I remember I remember that one in particular she didn't play I don't remember her playing a solo recitals but she played she and her husband played you know all the big cello piano literature mm -hmm. and what's her her husband's first name Nikolai Nikolai okay. he was from uh, Latvia originally and she was from Russia when you were growing up, did you um, play any other instruments or sing in a choir or anything like that? It was really barren as far as music was concerned. I had a ukulele. <laughs> oh my. The neighbor gave me a ukulele and showed me a few chords. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You were saying earlier that you, um, the Minneapolis Symphony, Symphony you know, performed contemporary music. Um, do you remember, uh, was it... Um, to, to you, was that was there something unusual or special about that? Was it something just part of when you went to concerts? Well, it didn't really begin to happen. The first conductor of the Minneapolis Symphony that I heard was Eugene Ormandy. Yeah. Um, and then, and he didn't, I don't remember any contemporary music there, but there pro there may have been some. Mm -hmm. I Frankly, I think when I, I was so little, I probably slept through the, half uh -huh. the concerts, but... Um, it was when Metropolis came, and that was much later. Um, I don't know exactly when he came, but I think it was when I was already... Well, certainly when I began studying with um, with uh, Joanna Groudon, because uh, it was Metropolis who invited him to come. Uh, so, But I didn't really become aware of contemporary music until uh, 
later, I think probably when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> I was going to say it was when I began going to the rehearsals, but I wasn't going to the rehearsals when I was in high school. Um, I think it was probably already when I was in college and going to the rehearsals that I got interested in contemporary mm -hmm. music. So you didn't study any of the contemporary piano repertoire before then? Nothing. I think really, uh, mostly I played, you know, not very interesting stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. um, every once in a while, <clears throat> I'll hear something and, and realize, oh, yeah, I played that at some point or other. When, mm -hmm. uh, but I, it's all kind of a blank. The first thing, um, yeah, I was already studying with Hansi. She was called Hansi Grauden. Um, I played the Schumann A minor piano concerto with that little orchestra uh -huh. when I was probably in high school when I was in 11th grade or something like that and I also played with another student of hers the uh, the Mozart two piano concerto uh -huh. flat concerto oh my. Um, and then I gave um, solo recitals and, uh, when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I don't remember much of of what I played. I remember the Mendelssohn Serious Variations. <laughs> um, and not much, much more. There was that whole well-tempered clavier thing. But I studied a lot of music with her. Mm -hmm. What are some of the kind of musical values that, um, that you kind of learned from her that have stayed with you? Well, um, I suppose the most important was this total reverence for the score. You <laughs> had to try to do what the composer wanted. You were supposed to, that was supposed to be knowable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you were supposed to be absolutely true to the score. I remember much later uh, talking about improvising, and she thought improvising was terrible uh -huh. uh, uh, because I I got somewhere or other I, I began and I still do when I'm uh, working on a piece and there's some part that I'm having trouble with understanding or playing or something I'll start improvising around it so that the thing the composer wrote is one possible one possibility in among many and I play around with all of them then I come back to the to the real one and it makes, and then I can begin to understand what the problem was. Mm -hmm. But um, she was, she was absolutely uh, reverent when it came to the score. Um, and then she gave me, I remember the Brahms exercise, Brahm wrote, Brahms wrote a book of piano exercises. I that, didn't know. Uh, wow. 51 exercises. Wow. Uh, and they're very good, and I, I did a lot of those. She also gave me other te technical stuff, uh, mm -hmm. ways of practicing scales and arpeggios, and nobody had ever done that before. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I played uh, much more repertoire, Chopin and Beethoven and, and Bach and Schumann and um, Brahms, uh, the whole works. I mean, she really, that the most important thing she did was to uh, introduce me to the the real piano literature. Mm -hmm. Did you do any Debussy? Yes, Claire de Lune. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I think that was yes. I'm sure that that was because I remember when I went um, when I went to Europe on the Fulbright. There was an initial interview, and they asked me, "Did I had I played any contemporary music?" And that, and I said, "WC." That was as uh -huh. far as. <laughs> <laughs> so in in um, high school, you mentioned you had played with some some singers, uh, company. Yeah, some singers. But it was probably already when I was in college. Okay. Uh, I remember playing Schubert Leader mm -hmm. a little bit, but it yeah. wasn't. Much it's no anything. real ensemble experience prior nothing, to, to, to college. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And I didn't know any other 
people who did music until I got to college. Wow. I was totally alone in all of that. Were there any... Um, there must have been some important musical experiences you had prior to college that really kind of caught your attention. I don't think so. No? I mean, yeah. just the just the Groudons and that mm -hmm. whole circle. That mm -hmm. was. Then I really I began practicing a lot, which I don't, and and sort of thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. And before that, I don't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Was there, did you hear much music on the radio, classical music on the radio? My father listened to the Metropolitan Opera on Saturday afternoon. Uh -huh. And we had, uh, initially, an old wind-up Victrola. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he listened to Shelley Oppen. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but there, I don't remember hearing, it, it was uh, vocal music that he liked. Yeah. Um, other than that, nothing. Mm-hmm. When you were um, in, in high school, what did you have any kind of future plans for, for music, or were you just doing it because you just well, wanted to do it? Well, it was sort of ordained that that's what I was going to do, mm -hmm. and I, I, got out of, I got out of school early. I was at home in the early afternoon. I didn't really know anybody. Uh, um, I would go home and supposedly I was supposed to practice, mm -hmm. but I, oh, well, I guess I did, because I learned all this stuff. But um, it was, um, I don't remember. Um, I I just didn't have any kind of a musical education except for my piano lesson. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you didn't do any study of music theory prior to, to college? Did, certainly not. Wow. Um, <laughs> Except there were the, these little um, sessions with Krennic that, but I don't think I really knew what that was all about. And I obviously didn't because when I went to the University of Minnesota as a music major and took the first theory class, I hated it. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I just didn't have it didn't have anything to do with anything as far as I was concerned. I had no problem with it, the ear training stuff and that was I also as I remember being my mother was always trying to get a diagnosis or something. Um what later she called a prognosis. <laughs> and I remember being taken when I was quite young to the guy who was the head of the University of Minnesota Music Department, Mr. Scott, um, to be evaluated. And uh, I remember he tested my ear, and at that point I, uh, well, I must have had absolute pitch because I remember being a parlor exhibit, too. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember him just playing a whole handful of, of notes that I was supposed to, you know, keys, and I yeah. was supposed to say what they were. But I don't have absolute pitch now. Wow. <laughs> so you have a degree in philosophy f from the University of Minnesota from 1946. Um, when did your interest in, in um, philosophy, how did that, that kind of come about? Yeah. It, are you sure the four, 1946 is right? I'm well, not that sure. was a thought. That was what was on your resume. Maybe the date well, is wrong. Maybe it isn't. But because I remember I didn't go to uh, Berkeley until forty eight, but okay, maybe that. Maybe I think it was. A, I think it's it maybe a little later than that. Okay. Um, uh, well, I started Minnesota when uh, at uh, in nineteen forty one. Okay. Uh, but I took then I went to. Uh, I went to New York after two years. Okay. For the first two years, I was a music major, I guess. Um, Maybe I switched already in the second year to philosophy because I, I really didn't like the, but mostly I was doing a lot of practicing at that point, mm -hmm. um, and, and playing, uh, <coughs> and going. By this point, my mother had was beginning to be worried that I was a social misfit because since she had denied me my, since I had been, um, I hadn't been part of the kid community at all. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, she, of course, I had to go to the university, and I had to join a sorority, and I had to do all those things. But it was at that point that I also, uh, then I began studying with Krennic. I think that was probably uh, when I was, it may have been when I was still in high school, but certainly when I was in college, and I studied 16th century counterpoint with him. Um, and then I began going to all of the uh, ISCM concerts, mm -hmm. which he organized and ran. Uh, and at that point, I, uh, and then I met some of his students. He was teaching at Hamlin. Um, and I met some of his students, and then I began to have a kind of sense of what this music world was, was all about. But that was, I think, uh, already when I started college. Mm -hmm. But your, your interest in philosophy, how did that kind of come about? Well, I probably took a philosophy course along with the other courses I was taking, and uh, there was this guy, Herbert Feigl, mm -hmm. who was a sort of friend of my parents and lived near where we lived, um, and I probably took a course with him. Um, and that was interesting. So I began taking more courses with him and with other people in the philosophy department. Um, and I liked that was much more interesting than the music courses, mm -hmm. which, were, which I thought were useful. Was that kind of intellectual discourse part of your family? Well, kind of? my family, they were certainly intellectuals, yeah. and there were certainly big talk yeah. discussions going on around the dinner table, and um, my brother my brother was in medical school. The conversation at the dinner table was about his cadaver and what my mm -hmm. and my father seeing this beautiful cancer of the cervix that day. And, yeah. <laughs> and my mother would stop it after a while. <laughs> <laughs> but she was very active in the Minneapolis community and politics and in the Jewish community. And she claimed that she was the one who got uh, Hubert Humphrey to run for governor. He was... Uh, um, he was a professor at the university at the time. She, anyhow, she was a big supporter of his and a big campaigner for him. And, um, they were generally leftist politically. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my mother was probably considered a communist, which is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't any communist party around that I know of. Although my father had a relative who was a Trotskyite, who went to Mexico with Trotsky, and <laughs> and he was not liked by the family. He was, he was, uh, uh, he was bad. Uh, but there certainly was. My mother read a lot. My father read a lot. There was a lot of intellectual stimulation. Mm -hmm. in that there was no music, but lots of mm -hmm. of. Uh, on the other hand, I didn't like to read at all, um, and so and I didn't read. Uh, except what I had to read for school. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know why, but I just didn't like to read. I was much more interested in dogs. <laughs> Did you ever like a pet dog or something? Yeah. Well, I was always wanting to have a dog, and my mother would always tell me to play with the dog next door. <laughs> <laughs> but I, then there, we finally did get a dog, and that was a terrible catastrophe. We had Actually, there were several dogs. One died of distemper. Um, and then we had another dog, and at that point, in fact, I was reading, maybe that's why I didn't like to read, I was reading a book, and I saw the dog go out of the fence, out of the gate, and I thought, well, I'll go get him in a few minutes, but it was too late. He got run over, uh, mm -hmm. and that was, that was a big disaster. But when I was in junior high school, coming home, uh, when all the other kids were still in school, and I'd stop at uh, at the neighbor's yard and talk to the two dogs there about what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, animals were always uh, important. So when you were in college and you got interested in philosophy, that that thing with reading that must have been. Uh, well, by that time I was reading, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
But certainly when I was in college, I yeah. was reading all the time. Yeah. And probably also in high school, but I didn't read as a avocation, mm -hmm. as a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Is that? So you mentioned that um, Krennic was a, um, a friend of Johanna Grauden, and you had taken counterpoint lessons with him. Um, did, what other study did you do with him? Did you do like any score study or analysis? And I think so, uh, because she organized, uh, Joanna organized these, well, it, certainly in connection with the uh, performance of all of the uh, Bach preludes and fugues. He uh, came and talked to us about them and did some analysis. Um, and also, uh, there was a lot of interaction with him. No formal uh, mm -hmm. analysis course or anything. Uh, the lessons were these with 16th century counterpoint thing, but um, in connection with the with the ISCM concerts and the. Um, he, uh, well, you know, I learned not only about 16th century counterpoint, but he was also lots of talk about 12 tone. I was just going to uh, ask, yeah. 12 tone stuff and uh, some analysis of it. Um, and uh, I think I must have spent quite a bit of time hanging around and uh, talking about music in various ways with him. Mm -hmm. Um, he's an interesting figure because he's um, seemed to be very opinionated, but yet there was a lot of change in his ideas over time. You know that I wrote my master's thesis on his four piano no, sonatas. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> right, I didn't well, know I, that. four. There were then four piano sonatas. Mm -hmm. That was my thesis, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, one of the big points in the thesis was that he changed, well, first it was Johnny Spiel to Elf, which was jazz. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, then came the 12 tone stuff, uh, which he was still pretty much into, I think, when I, when I knew him. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, he, he, uh, made fun of it, because I remember, <laughs> well, he sort of made fun of it, um, and he certainly dis distinguished between among the ways in which it was used. Um, you talked about <laughs> a woman who came to study with him composition, and after uh, a month or something, she said she was so grateful to him, teaching her this twelve tone thing, because before that it used to take her months and months to write a piece, and now she could write a piece in a week. <laughs> And it was probably just as bad as the other pieces. <laughs> but that was certainly where I, that's where I got introduced mm -hmm. to to uh, 20th century music. Tell me a little bit more about his, what he was telling you about the 12-tone theory. I mean, you read some statements of his, and he was talking about it being the future of music and very kind of strident about that. But he obviously had... Uh, well, and on the other hand, there's this book, I've forgotten what it is, the music appreciation book that he wrote. Uh -huh. That's something like all about music. That's not right, but uh, it's a very good book. Um, I don't think I have it anymore. I don't know what mm -hmm. happened to it. But he was he was a wonderful teacher, um, and not at all um, like Schoenberg. He wasn't only teaching twelve tone stuff. He was, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, he was an incredible um, musician. He could sit down and play on the piano. Uh, Beethoven Symphony, or or some uh, atonal piece. Uh, he was a very good pianist, um, and uh, he 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 among many others uh, completed uh, one of the Schubert's piano sonatas that's unfinished. Mm -hmm. um, and he he just had an incredible ear. He could play anything. And if he, he'd play it and sing what he couldn't play, and, um, well, he was certainly a kind of person that I had never ever met or knew existed. He was he was a really profound, very thorough, and and not and and diversified mm -hmm. uh, musician. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike Hansi Grauden, who um, who was a piano player. <laughs> right. 
Um, so the fact that, that she made that connection, I think, was probably very important. So, uh, and it was, it was uh, studying with Feigl and also with this guy Sellers, who was the other. Well, as a matter of fact, the University of Minnesota was pretty amazing at that point. Um, um, Alfred Kazin came to teach um, in the English department, and I took courses with him and got to know him. And Saul Bellow was there for quite a while, right. and I got to know him quite well and his whole family. Um, and then there was Feigl and Sellers and the, uh, oh, and also, um, what's his name? The red-headed poet from the South. Um, can't think of it at the moment, but um, there were a lot of extraordinary people around, around that university at that point. Plus, and then, oh yeah, there was Louis Krasner, who was the oh, concert master. Yeah, my. And I spent a lot of time with, with uh, his family. Um, in fact, after um, the Groudons left, <coughs> the Krasners sort of took over as my musical family. Um, and he, Louis, organized a whole series of concerts. Um, at um, McAllister, um, uh, j not just contemporary music. In fact, uh, they played the uh, musical offering, I remember. Um, and again, I got a whole education through those concerts that he organized. So, you know, at some point in up, um, upper uh, years of high school, Everything changed, really, because of Hansi Grauden. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Metropolis and Krasner and Krennic and this, it was a sort of, we called it the Athens of the West. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in your studies with, um, with Krennic, um, are there things that have kind of st stayed with you, musical values and stuff like that? Uh, well, um, that you can take a piece of music and think about it. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, you can go deeply into into a piece of music. Uh, there was not much connection. There was studying music and doing um, um, counterpoint and so forth, but it didn't connect much with performance, <laughs> mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. uh, is the case generally, yeah. I think. Right. Uh, although he was a wonderful performer. Yeah. we, As far as I remember, we never talked about performance I never with uh -huh. him uh, and I never talked about the pieces I was playing with him uh -huh. and Hansi Grauden her way of teaching was play this louder and wiggle that finger more and uh, nothing about the music mm -hmm. <laughs> except to be faithful to it yeah. whatever that meant did Krennic talk much about some of the other composers that he knew I mean that was a real kind of hotbed of, of activity. And well, he certainly, you know, there was the Alban people Berg and, the, yeah. well, not, not so much that, more the Vienna, yeah. Viennese thing. Uh -huh. um, I don't remember him, I don't uh, remember him talking about the sort of politics of contemporary mm -hmm. music at that point. D did he talk about the, um, you know, the, the musical revolution that was happening and, and or did he see it that way? I don't know. Uh, since I was such a hick <laughs> from mm -hmm. the farm, I mean, not literally, but um, I just ha had no sense of what, of any of that that mm -hmm. was going on. Mm -hmm. So he, I know that he was, uh, he felt, I mean, here he was at this, this little podunk university, a college university yeah. in Hamlin. I mean, there were all these people around who were European, who were refugees, and um, not very happy that they were stuck in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Mm -hmm. So there was, I think, quite a bit of, of uh, well, one thing that, that was very fortunate was that because they were stuck in Minneapolis and St. Paul, they were very accessible to somebody like me, mm -hmm. uh, much more so than in New York, for example. So there was this very tight community of, of refugees, music music people and refugees. Um, and Feigl 
wasn't part of that, but still he was sort of part of that. Mm -hmm. There was this whole group of people who were who were out of place and and found each other and uh, were very happy to adopt um, a kid who was uh, interested in music. Uh, so that and that was that was the good part about being in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about your studies with um, Arthur Schnabel um, and Schnabel knew Krennic. I is that correct? Was it, is that I the think connection? so. He certainly knew Sessions. Uh -huh. No, the connection was Joanna Groudon. Okay, she sent me to Schnabel as sending me to her teacher, mm -hmm. um, and that's how I how I got to him. I don't remember playing for him before I went. I remember she had me play for Sirkin. Uh, and I, in fact, when I was 12, I went to audition at, Sir, at, at Curtis, but mm -hmm. I didn't get in. Um, and uh, I don't remember playing for, for Schnabel, but she insisted that I did. So I guess I did because he came periodically to play with the orchestra, um, and I guess I played for him. I definitely remember playing for Circuit. Um, but anyhow, she sent he accepted me, and mm -hmm. uh, I always had the feeling he accepted me simply because she said so. But maybe I actually played for him. So where did you start studying with him? And eventually, he was in New York. Um, but did you study in New York? Yeah, he was already a refugee living yeah. at the Peter Stuyvesant Hotel mm -hmm. um, on Eighty Sixth and Central Park West, um, and uh, I was, I guess, eighteen when I went to um, went to New York. And that was what nineteen forty three. That's this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then you went to Columbia University. Yeah, right. because my parents at this point said I had to go to the university. <coughs> but um, I went there. Uh, Columbia had a special program for professional children. Um, it was called the University Undergraduates, and they that was how women could because Columbia was still all boys. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, or men, I suppose you're supposed to say. And um, it was just a fluke. I went to um, I went to register and the person that I that interviewed me, I was going to take you know extension courses or something. Mm -hmm. The person who interviewed me said, "Well, you should be in university undergraduates." which allowed me to take any course in any part of the university that I wanted to. And not just, I mean, that program was supposed to be for children who are like working during the day or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, it didn't mean, it, I could take any courses I wanted to. And that was when the philosophy thing got really going. I took a course um, from Erwin Edmund on, on aesthetics, Kassirer, um uh, all kinds of my my uh, advisor was Ernest Nagel, uh -huh. um, so and that was uh, I lived right practically around the corner from from Columbia, uh, and that was very important because that was my I mean I wasn't at Juilliard or someplace else where there were other students again I was off isolated somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and when I went, going to Columbia, uh, I still didn't really meet anybody much. Um, it was during the war, and, uh, so the population was kind of funny. I, I seem to remember people who were older in those classes, but they were, they were very good classes. Um, and that was... The first two years I was um, going 43, 44, 45, I was studying, uh, taking a lot, well, the, all of the, stu there were three of us, Leon Fleischer, Claude Frank, and myself. And then for a while, uh, a woman named Hilda Banks, 
and for a while Deacon Newland. Um, and uh, everybody went to everybody else's lessons, which was a big uh, important thing because we not only heard what he had to say about the piece we were studying, but everybody else's pieces as well. And he, ne he, he only played a piece for him once. Um, you came with your piece. He had his upright piano over there and the grand piano over here. And you played the piece. And then he went at it. Um, very often um, spending a lot of time on the first, the very beginning of the piece, sort of like, like Beethoven sketches, uh, which have the implications for everything that happens in the rest of the piece. Um, but uh, the very first lesson, he would ask. He asked me a question like, "Why did you do it that way?" or something, and not, not aggressively, but really asking. Nobody had ever asked me a question like that before. Nobody had ever <clears throat> asked me why I did something or suggested that there was more than one way of doing it or that you could think about that, that this was a decision process. Uh, and I had no idea how to even engage such a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that uh, that had a huge effect uh, because I, I had no idea how to think about those things. So I sort of got paralyzed. I mean, I, I really, I, I got, I, I couldn't play for for quite a while. I mean, I could play, but but it was all kind of self-conscious and stiff. Um, and of course, in those days, I was practicing a huge amount. I was practicing like three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon, but all now trying to understand, uh, trying to think about why am I doing it this way or that way. Mm -hmm. And he also sent all of his students to study with Eric Eder Kahn, who was a sort of second-rate, well, not very nice, but he was certainly not a well-known composer, but we had to study theory with him. Mm -hmm. And one of the things was that I was a terrible sight reader. I mean, really, really awful. Um, and because I, you know, I'd get whoever was the teacher to play it for me, and then, then I could use the score because I knew what it was supposed to sound like. Um, and so that the first lesson, he wanted to talk about a Bach chorale, and he asked me to play it, and I couldn't play it. I mean, I couldn't read it. And he thought I was fooling him or something. But I really couldn't sight read. Uh, and I think that's one thing that has made me become so interested in the whole business of notation and uh, what, it, uh, what it captures and what it doesn't capture and why, why people have trouble learning it and learning to read standard notation um, and what it has to do with with um, learn with playing and learning from the score and then getting beyond the score, getting off the score. Um, so uh, that was that was at the very beginning of the lessons. But um, you know, I studied a lot of stuff with him. Well, Schnabel seems. Um somewhat unusual as far as insisting that the students really understand the score. Mm -hmm. um, and there he was making a connection between music theory and performance. Absolutely, he was. And he, he was always talking about the music. He never talked about technique for one minute. Um, his general approach was, if you know how you want it to sound, you'll find a way to make it that way. Uh, and he, uh, you know, if you complained about the piano, he that was no excuse. He used to say you should be able to play it on a noodle board. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the other hand, he would, uh, I mean, he didn't just, he played a lot. Um, but he, he wouldn't just play, he would, there was always a reason. 
and he was talking, he talked particularly, and this goes back to the Dal Crows thing again, he talked particularly about phrasing. And he was very much interested in, I mean, if you look at the Beethoven um, editions of the sonatas, you find these Roman numerals sitting there, which have nothing to do with harmony. <laughs> they have to do with the, with the phrase structure. How many bars? So he would he was very um, interested in the in asymmetrical in moments when the phrase phrasing was asymmetrical, and he was very interested. The whole thing was to project the structure. Right. That was what he talked about. And what's interesting about his use of music theory, it's not to explain the piece of music, but to give you creative tools as a performer. Absolutely. Because uh, he seemed almost hostile to. Um, an academic analysis of music, because he said that doesn't explain the music. Well, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. It's 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 arid. <laughs> and what he was he was interested in making the music come alive and projecting that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember studying the Mozart B flat sonata, and I must have spent. He must have spent half an hour. On on dee da 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 um dee da 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 um just that much. Um, first of all, it shouldn't be dee da 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 dee da da um, but it should be dee da 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 dee da da um. Uh, and he he was he generally, if you listen, you'll hear he he goes to the ends of phrases, even if it's a weak beat ending. Um, but then he he would put words to these things. <laughs> so, listen to the bird he's saying, <laughs> and by putting words to them, you would get the articulation that mm -hmm. he that he had in mind. Um, and that may come, you know that his career started as an accompanist to his wife, before she was his wife. I, I didn't know that's how it started, but... Uh, Teresa, that yeah. was really his first career, mm -hmm. was as her accompanist. Mm -hmm. um, and she was, she continued uh, forever to be the, the um, the uh, final opinion. <laughs> I mean, she she was a wonderful musician, and he took what she said as the as the gospel. Um, so that sometimes uh, the lessons were in his uh, apartment there in the Peter Stuyvesant Hotel, um, and she was around, of course. So the way it worked, there were lessons lasted about three hours, and you can imagine they would if he spent half an hour on that. the The point was in that thing that that uh, the left hand, um, the the grouping, the phrasing is diff is uh, goes against overlaps the phrasing in the right hand, and he wanted to he he that was what he was working on that I should you should be able to hear both of them, both of these groupings, and I was having a really hard time doing that, at which point he, uh, at some point he said, Miss Shapiro, perhaps you should take up the clarinet. <laughs> Since I could only play one line after that. <laughs> um, but, um, so there were, the lesson was three hours, and after three hours there would be tea. Um, and we would all have tea, and he would hold forth on whatever he was reading, including admitting that he would read the beginning and the end of a book, and then he would uh, fill in the details. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought it was very funny that I was studying philosophy. Um, and he would make jokes about it. He'd tease me about it. Um, and uh, in those, when we had tea, um, Teresa, his wife, I remember one time uh, she said that she, well, we didn't hear it, but when we came back and it was time for the next lesson, he made Hilda, who had taken the previous lesson, come back because Teresa said the tempo was too fast. And so they had to take care of that. So we went up. Um, so, but certainly the focus was on he would pick some aspect of the music itself and and work at trying to get you to project. Sometimes a detail like that, sometimes um, big uh, structure. Was it one lesson a, a week or did you have more? Well, every other week. Every other week. But every week 
I was there with uh, yeah. with the other people. Mm -hmm. There's so many aspects of this <laughs> novel that um, you know, I, 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 it's it's hard to to choose, but um, some ideas that are um, really interesting. He, he talks about the futility of recreating the composer's intention. <laughs> And, Which, you know, that's still a big thing out there even today. Right. Well, that's why I was making jokes about Hansi Groudon, who was, you were supposed to be, yeah, right. And um, all of that was was so new to me. And I was so scared. Anyhow, every time I'd go for a lesson, I was sure I was insulting him by my play. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so totally uneducated as far as music was concerned. Um and uh, no, the the it was not to recreate the composer's intentions, but to recreate the 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 music that, and that was your job was to try to find uh, to understand the the piece, and not to start out by thinking what did Beethoven want me to do. Right, and he talked about sure. the performer becoming equal with the. Uh, the, the composer. And right, and he also, another um, big thing was that I quote often, practicing should be experiment, not drill. Um, and he he would experiment. I'd stand outside the, the apartment door and listen to him practice, and he was always practicing um, phrasing mm -hmm. and experimenting, uh, uh, both with the with the you know the where the bound phrase boundaries were, but also how to project it, um, and that I I think I associate that again with the Dal Crow stuff, which is also all about movement uh, and phrasing, and um, and so I think that's that's why uh, when I watch what people who have no music background, no music training, kids. When I see that what they're what they're representing in their invented notations, there that's what they're representing, this figural grouping, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I would have noticed it. I don't think I would have been so sensitive to it. I wouldn't have understood it if it hadn't been for this collected background of of uh, emphasis on on that kind of a live structure and also the whole issue of of um, anything from a motive to a note changing its function depending on the context. That was something else that I think he was, um, you know, you can't play this the same as you did before because it's it's, in a, it's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that was a big point. So it's it's c interesting in a, in a, in a way, it, maybe it's kind of, kind of paradoxical, paradoxical, but I'm sure he didn't see it that way. He was insisting on accurate editions of the score, which seems you know, very scholarly, and it's scholars who do those, but yet there's this um, tension with, with musical scholarship. Yeah, well, but you have to have the score yeah. in order to, to right. find out what, you, what, you're, what the material is that right. you're working with. You know, for him it wasn't then an authentic recreation of the, com the composer's intention, but you had to start with something that didn't have somebody else's interpretive ideas in it. For sure, and that was that was very important. You shouldn't use somebody else's edited edition. And it's, you know, in the in the his edition of the Beethoven sonatas, it's very clear what's hi, what's him and what's Beethoven. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, well that that may be sort of what led me to the business of the Beethoven fingerings. Um, yeah, your article. About, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, because the Beethoven finger, the fingerings that Beethoven wrote in, are groupings. <laughs> they're not technical. In fact, they're often terribly awkward technically. But they tell you what the score, an ordinary score, can't tell you. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, I think at the end of Opus 111, there's a C major scale, which he fingers one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, because that's the grouping. Uh -huh. um, and there are many more. I mean, I found, um, you know, I really, s that was the first paper I ever wrote. But I was interested in it because it, again, was a performance issue. The fingerings were, 
well, it was a wedding of the performance issues with the with structure. Mm -hmm. So he was putting in fingerings in order to, as a means of helping you to project the structure and very often the the grouping structure. Uh, in the beginning of the um, 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 Opus 81A um, Sonata, uh, at the very beginning there their uh, their court their he he there's a crescendo and he fingers at five 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 uh, mm -hmm. well but it's legato <laughs> oh. well it and it works uh -huh. because if you try to uh, you know hang on and play it legato you can't hit me a crescendo and you really get this feeling of movement towards the goal uh, by going by so if you you don't have to use his fingering, but you have to try it yeah. because it's telling you something, and you get a feel for what he what what's going on in the music by by um, trying his fingering. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so and all of that's in related to this whole notion of grouping and figures in contrast to meter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. There's a quote here, um, he says, I do not believe that great composers are ever inspired by the specific qualities of instruments. Yet, in the same paragraph, he says, the conception of musical ideas in the composer's mind is followed by a gradual indication as to which of the available instruments might be suited to convey those ideas. And then he says, the greatest part of Beethoven's piano music can commu be communicated only by means of the piano. Yeah, well, but I think if you take the the chronology there, he's saying that the composer isn't initially inspired right. That's right. by by the uh, instruments, but once he's got something that he wants to project, then he's going to look for the instruments that are right. And in case of the Beethoven piano sonata, that's the piano. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, when I was reading that, it got me thinking about some of his comments about historical instruments and and stuff like that and he was um, <laughs> has some problems with that because <laughs> right. um, people talk about Beethoven you know hearing his piano in his head when he's writing it yeah um, and um, did he talk to you much about the, you know, historical you know, performance he issues poo pooed it yeah <laughs> he, yeah he thought, um, and he certainly didn't the, he didn't. I think I don't know whether he said this or where, but um, the general feeling was if Bach had had a piano, he would have loved it, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and if Beethoven had had a big Steinway, he would have been very happy. What did he think of the harpsichord as an instrument? I never heard him say anything about it, but I'm sure he <laughs> thought it was kind of uh, piddling. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Maybe I'm just projecting. Yeah. With this um, idea of you know the, the composer at some point getting a clear conception of the instruments for the music, what do you think of arrangements of pre-existent works? Well, by the way, maybe you can answer this question. Somebody used a piece, was working with kids, and it was a piece, of Mozart piece for violin, piano and cello and flute. I don't think there is any such piece. No, I don't think so. There is an example. Yeah. Uh, and we were thinking maybe um, maybe it, the flute was playing maybe it was a string quartet for all I know. Uh -huh. I don't know what it was but anyhow. Uh, uh, I never heard him talk about arrangements but um, I don't think he would be particularly interested. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't know. Another interesting um, idea of his, among so many, this idea of the autonomy of art and that in, in music that the a particular piece is a unique entity um, that must be looked at, you know, solely on its own terms, and that's. Certainly not a current idea. Out well, there it today. was. It was. It was during the critical, you know, the in in literature. Right. Um, 
and I think, well, I don't know that he was part of that, but it was certainly the same point of view. Right. This is, it has nothing to do with what Beethoven had for breakfast or, or uh, you know, what he was reading or this is the piece and everything you need to know is there. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's your um, feelings about that? Is your... Is well, I certainly, I tend to lean in that direction, mm -hmm. I would say. I, uh, you know, at, at the University of Chicago, I taught a course in art, music, and literature. Um, and we all, it was a big course, and uh, we all taught all three. But we never crossed over. Uh, right. We'd have three weeks in one area and three weeks in another area. And if kids make connections, fine. But um, uh, I've never, except with Krennic, <laughs> And and my thesis, it was clear that that uh, his life and the changes in his life uh, changed the style in which he was writing. That was, and I tried to make that connection in the, mm -hmm. in the thesis. Um, but in general, I don't think it's very interesting. I mean, Schnabel talks about you know, the danger of stylistic um, generalizations, even even within a composer's. I'll right. Put. It's funny because a lot of this stuff I uh, I feel is part of me and maybe that's where I got mm -hmm. it originally. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, but it's also Schoenberg, style and idea. You know, the idea is what's important, not the style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Schnabel was obviously known as a distinguished performer of Mozart, Schubert, and, and Beethoven. Um, um, did he publicly be perform any contemporary music? I don't think he even performed his own music. Uh -huh. You know, he composed I was, yeah, a I was lot. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you about that. But. No, I, I, uh, it's not when I knew him. He may uh -huh. have when he was younger, I don't know. Could but you? he was very, he was, he felt closest, much closer to somebody like Roger Sessions. Um, then, uh, then I think he did to uh, other pianists. Mm -hmm. He he really he he's he said, uh, I don't teach the piano. Does the carpenter teach the hammer? <laughs> <laughs> and you know he was he was it was music that was mm -hmm. it wasn't he was he really wasn't teaching the piano. Mm -hmm. And he was interested in, uh, his interests were in other uh, people who were interested in close to music, not mm -hmm. to um, mm -hmm. piano playing. Did you study any contemporary repertoire with him? No. Nope. Would he have been, it wouldn't have been a problem though if I he had brought I don't know, it in? nobody else did either. Um, I don't think there was anything beyond Brahms. Uh, certainly no French music. I don't know if he talks about French music, but I have a big bias against French music. Uh -huh. I don't know whether I got it, where I got it, but well, it was also with sessions. I mean, there was the Stravinsky Schoenberg yes. thing, and right. Stravinsky was on the French side. I still don't like French music. Did you ever play any of Schnabel's piano music? No. No, uh, surprisingly, Metropolis played a symphony of um, of, uh, of Schnabel. Schnabels, yeah, uh, with the Minneapolis Symphony, um, and he came, and uh, that was, uh, of course, the audience hated it. And, it's, have you ever heard any of his music? Yes, yeah, you loan me a oh, CD, yeah. and there's also <coughs> a CD we have with some choral music. Choral music. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, um, it's so interesting that here's this very um, august classical pianist, um, yet his music um, doesn't seem to you know overtly reflect that. You know, it's it's non tonal, um, and well, but only in in sort of it's struct highly structured. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say about uh, something about his 
I don't remember about his composition, but uh, he was really quite. Um, that was where he saw his real. Oh, I know. I was going to say, have you ever heard any of his cadenzas for the Mozart concerto? No. <laughs> no. Well, they're pretty far out. <laughs> um, there must be some. I'm sure there's some recorded because. I'll have to look. Yeah. That, that would be very curious. So. Yeah. Well, they're. It's not in the, on the order of when Schnitke did um, cadenzas for stuff. No, because those are funny. Uh -huh. uh, but these are very serious, and they're uh, they're sort of on the verge of being atonal, but not quite. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. wow. Um, very chromatic. Did, did Schnabel talk to you much about his music? And, and just those... Um, that different world that he inhabited as a composer as opposed to a... a no. Uh, all I know is that he he really enjoyed uh, being with Roger Sessions. He sent me to Roger Sessions. Schnabel sent me to Sessions. Mm -hmm. um, and... But I don't... No. He, I don't ever remember him talking about his own composing. Except that he had the usual 20th century... Um, uh, paranoid attitude because nobody plays his music, nobody likes this kind of music and that kind of stuff. I don't think, I don't know, paranoid is probably not the right word to say, but resentment. Yeah. Yeah. But that was that was hard on uh, other people. Oh, know, yeah. Schoenberg and all of them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I think uh, Schoenberg was really paranoid. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Read oh, his was. letters. Oh. Yeah, right. Gosh. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was quite shocked when I read some of the yeah. letters to the editor. He'd write back. And, <laughs> right. Well, I'll when we get there, I'll tell you about my visit to Schoenberg. <laughs> oh, I, I, I do have a question there. Yeah. Moving on, so we don't. Um, okay. Um, in 1946, you played a concerto movement in D major. At the time, it was believed to be by Beethoven. Um, it was with a uh, performance with the City of St. Paul Pop Concert. That's, right. And that's the, that's the Minneapolis Pops Orchestra? Right. Yeah. So tell me um, about finding this piece and performing it and what brought that about. Well, I found it in, in the um, Newark Public Library. Mm -hmm. How, why I went there and went looking for it. I think I was probably looking for for unedited, you know, looking for editions of stuff I was playing. Um, mm -hmm. In the Beethoven collected works. Exactly, uh, yeah, exactly. The, the I 1888 think that's, edition with I, Guido Adler. That's right. Yeah. I think that's, and I just stumbled on it. Mm -hmm. um, and took it home and played it and thought, I've made a discovery. Yeah, and there's no <laughs> indication in that edition that there was any question of authenticity. So. Not that I know of. Yeah. Except that in my, that's not true. Because in my, I, I cop had, I don't know whether Xerox or what, but I made a copy of, of, of it that I used to mm -hmm. learn it. And there's an asterisk and a footnote. Now, and I, I, at this point, very moment I can't remember what the footnote said but I think there was somebody else's maybe it simply said that Guido Adler found it or something uh -huh. but um, it's now attributed to somebody else yeah isn't it? Um, this guy um, Johann um, um, Johann Josef Rosler yeah right 1771 that's to what I think I think the asterisk um, uh, has his name connected to it because I remember this name. <laughs> I mean, according but, to the research that I'd done, at, when Adler put it in there, he didn't know that there was any question of authenticity. Uh -huh. Well, then probably um, uh, somebody else might have just written that in, into the mm -hmm. uh, yeah. score. Yeah, it wasn't until 1925 that, um, that um, it was you know, correctly identified. Um, right. Well, and it was certainly after that that yeah. I. Yeah. Um, but I, that you still you still didn't seem to be publicly known because um, there have been numerous recordings of it hmm. claiming to be by T Beethoven, including some current CDs available now. Really? <laughs> well, um, 
I, re I remember telling Schnabel about it, and he said, well, what does it sound like? And I said, well, it sort of sounds like Mozart. And he was furious. One doesn't sound like Mozart. <laughs> Mozart is, is uh, you know, that was, again, style, mm -hmm. but not, not yeah. uh, Mozart, yeah. uh, not the piece of music. That was the end of the discussion. <laughs> wow. Um, so how did it come about that you got a chance to play this with the orchestra? Well, it's interesting that I couldn't have answered that question except that going through all of these mounds of letters that have, have surfaced, um, I found letters, um, I guess, to my mother. Anyhow, letters saying something about talking to the guy who was the conductor of that orchestra and arranging it, and I think Krasner was somehow involved, but okay. uh, it was manipulated <laughs> uh -huh. in the sense that uh, people got to the co the conductor, and the conductor agreed to uh, to perform it. Mm -hmm. And you wrote the cadenza for that, right? I did. Yeah. I also played it with the. University of California, the Berkeley, the in Berkeley, yeah, yeah, right, in 1950. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and Session said afterwards the best part was the cadenza. <laughs> <laughs> Do you and know he also said, by the way, when I was doing that, <laughs> going out to lunch with him, and he said, "Well, Gene, I hope you're not thinking of being a composer uh, because." Women who compose are very unhappy. <laughs> and then he started mentioning several of them who had been students of his, and all of whom were very unhappy. <laughs> wow. Did your performance of that piece um, draw attention to it um, by other pianists, do you know? I don't think so. I think it was, you know, sort mm -hmm. of a one shot thing, and that mm -hmm. was it. After yeah. all, you know, it was a college orchestra. Yeah, but as far as with the with a Minneapolis in, oh, in Minneapolis, not that I'm aware of. Uh huh. Pop's orchestra was, I, I guess, is it? You know, it it was in a big hall, a huge hall, but it, there were people were eating. You know, it was that kind of pop. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Schnabel used to say he didn't like to record. You'd never know he didn't like to record since he recorded all that stuff, but. He said he didn't like to record because he always imagined people listening to the record and eating. Yeah. <laughs> um, moving on to, to um, Roger Sessions, yeah. uh, who, whom you studied with, and according to your resume, 1948 through 1951, is that correct? correct. And your connection with Sessions was through, through Schnabel, right? He literally sent, sent me to him. But uh -huh. When I got my degree in um, philosophy, I mean, there I had a BA, and there was a big, I didn't know what to do, because, you know, I, suddenly I realized you can't get a job with a BA, and well, you know, what are you going to yeah. do? Um, and I went, I, I, vas I, I had to make a decision between, I was going to go to the University of Chicago, in the Committee on Social Thought because Schnabel had come and given a series of lectures there and he was a friend of the guy who ran it. Uh, so I was torn between going in that direc direction mm -hmm. some more and going and studying music for the first time really. I mean studying. Um, and I, by that time, I was really interested in trying to understand more about how a piece of music works. Um, and so that's why I, did, I went to study with Sessions instead of going to the University of Chicago and doing more philosophy kind right. of Right, so this was at the University of California at Berkeley when he right. was there. Right, right. Um, what courses, um, what kind of courses did you take with him? Did it also include any private study? Well, yes, definitely. Uh, first of all, I didn't have a degree in music, so I had to take the undergraduate music courses. Um, so I took courses from David Boyden and, um, and Bukowski. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> he and I did not get along very well. <laughs> um, and as well as session. And then I, I kept taking special topics. In fact, I really got my degree in special topics, uh-huh. which were uh, sessions with sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, and of what a lot of, in the beginning, Roger was writing his harmony book. And uh, I was a guinea pig. In fact, if you look at the introduction, if you look at the acknowledgments, you'll see uh, I was simply going through all the exercises with him. Um, and Bob helps. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he yeah. and I were the guinea pigs uh-huh. for the uh, for that book. Um, and that was fantastic education because uh, you know I was not only doing the exercises but he was talking with me about about them and that was that w- at that point theory got to be interesting because you know it wasn't following rules and not not being sure not to have any parallel fifths or something but it was all about function and structural functions and harmonic functions mm-hmm. and um, something that had to do with music and then I took his analysis class. <laughs> and he spent he spent the first he spent a, more than half of the semester on the first movement of the Eroica Symphony, um, and that was a revelation as far. Just just I I had no idea that there were things like that in music or that um, and uh, at the end. Uh, of the the exam at the end, he gave us a piece of music to to analyze, and I said I couldn't do it, and I was going to walk out of the exam. Uh, and he said, "Well, just do it. I won't read it. Uh, just do it for yourself." So I did it for myself, and of course he took it and read it, and it was fine. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, hanging around with all of these these big important people uh, it was very easy to feel pretty little mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so and then I was taking a, a composition course from somebody named Charles Cushing uh, and going to all of Sessions composition sem- seminars where uh, the composition students would bring their pieces and he would laboriously play them on the piano um, and talk about them and that was another whole education but this and just being around really for the first time uh, with other music students was a a whole new experience Um, there was I mean Leon Kirchner was teaching there as an instructor Uh, Earl Kim was away that first year. He had the Paris Prize, and he was in Paris. Andy Imbry was there, and I began playing all their music. I gave, you know, the first performance that's there on the uh, uh, one of these CDs, Am- Imbry's Piano Sonata, and Leon's... I don't think there's a recording of Leon's. Yeah, what we got here uh, is um, Embry and Sessions. Uh huh. Played Sessions, Second yeah. Sonata. Um, but I played. Wasn't there a tape or something of of his violin piano duo, Leon's? No. I don't know. Uh, I guess not. Um, but I played. Uh, you know, I played everybody's music, and that was. Um, that was another whole new life. Uh, and then I, uh, the second year, I was Sessions uh, TA in the analysis class. And that was also uh, uh, a wonderful experience because I really, he spent quite a bit of time reminiscing when I was in Florence, and <laughs> <laughs> telling bad stories about love affairs and whatever. But um, so the students would come to me for for help. Oh, yes. <laughs> and one of the things we had to do, and they had to do, we'd take a huge piece of of um, wrapping paper or something, a roll of wrapping paper, and analyze a piece 
from beginning to end on these uh, long rolls of paper, doing saying absolutely everything that you could about the the piece. So I was I had to help them because he didn't interact with the students much individually, um, and a lot of them didn't even understand what he was talking about a lot of the time because. We spent a, a lot of time on the first two chords in the Eurorica Symphony. Why did Why didn't he just start the piece? Uh -huh. Why did he? What are those two chords doing there? Well, you know, there was a lot of speculation about that, and also uh, I don't remember. Yeah, I guess it was in the analysis. Must have been a different analysis course. We studied the Schoenberg Fourth Quartet uh, and the Stravinsky. No, the Bartok. One of the Bartok quartets, mm -hmm. um, and that was a whole different way of. Um, I mean, the study of the fourth quartet wasn't. I don't remember him talking about twelve tone anything at all. He talked about it just like he talked about the Beethoven Eroica Symphony. Well, he seemed to have a a faith in if music was um, if it was a good piece of music and it was. What he called and um, had intelligibility. It didn't matter if somebody didn't understand it right away. He just seemed to have a faith in that, and didn't seem to be caught up in this um, accessibility. Yeah. Right. Well, I in fact I in the paper I just wrote I quoted him where he said he was uh, he was much more interested in the piece that he didn't understand at first and had to come to understand and a piece that he had to listen to many times. He also didn't like recordings. And the reason he didn't like recordings was because they were always the same. <laughs> um, and he he would get bored with the particular inflections that this performer um, was providing. Um, I also remember um, Petropolis coming. When Petropolis was going to play a piece of his. And Metropolis came and Sessions handed him the score and then was busy with something else. And the story was he came back after half an hour or an hour or something and Metropolis said now he, he knew the first movement by heart. <laughs> he always played, he always conducted without a score and I think he was one of the first people who did. Um, other people now, I guess, yeah. do. but. Conducted whatever it was without a score. Kind of gave him the freedom to not be tied to it. Right. Um, but on the other hand, he could sit and memorize it. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, Sessions and Schnabel both had a similar idea about faithfulness to the score, but not over interpreting. Yeah. Um, well, Schnabel used to say when you, uh, sometimes if you played in a way that that in, that inspired that he'd say you don't have to heat the music it's hot enough already <laughs> <laughs> um there's a um a quote here from um, sessions book questions on music yeah um that i'll read for some 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 comments here he says what one is supposed is sometimes tempted to regard as quasi-pathological is that musical analysis as sometimes practiced t today like many other things in our present day world often tended to become over specialized something to be pursued for its own sake often with the implied object of discovering and establishing the ultra ultimate criteria of music on a quasi-scientific, um, <laughs> supposedly rational basis. Concessions, however, are made somewhat grudgingly to what is called intuition, as a quasi-explanation of what cannot be fully explained in strictly ac analytical terms. And then he speaks of the antithesis between the creative and the analytical attitude towards composition. Um, this is coming from a very powerful intellect. You know, and that's uh, it's a well. That's what it takes in order to. Yeah. I mean, a less powerful intellect is willing to do all the things that he's talking about. Yeah. There. But he was never. Uh, he was always well experimenting. He was always playing around, considering different kinds of possibilities, and like those first two chords. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, what's the problem? You've got E flat major chords. He's establishing the key. Well, that's not good enough. I mean, he establishes the key when he goes dum da dum da da. Yeah. That establishes the key too. What? Uh, but but to to puzzle over why something is the way it is, the the recapitulation in the uh, um, in that first movement where the horn is playing sort of like he was still before it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, right. Well, you know, you can... What's that doing? Uh, but all of, There's so many puzzlements in any... I mean, that's the nature of complexity, is is that. And and it is like uh, like Schnabel, in that in the, it's not a question of... And I'm sure that, that had, all of that had a huge effect on, on my not sort of uh, joining the club of the music theorists, because they're uh they're just what what he says there mm -hmm. and it doesn't get to the to what everybody on the one hand what everybody knows how to do in in this culture that is to say to make sense of the music that's all around them it doesn't touch on on what the how they're doing that or what the nature of that uh knowledge is and knowledge and intuition but um uh on the other hand, it doesn't touch on on what performers are finding in a piece of music, mm -hmm. or what, or the nature of complexity, uh, and I think that's a really important and interesting subject. And without their saying it, that's sort of what they're what they're into. Is is that? In fact, at the end of that paper on uh, whichever paper I don't remember what paper it was, but at the end of the paper, I quoted. Sessions and Schnabel, both of them saying what they're interested in as the pieces that that they can, that they have to s listen to many times. Sessions also has an interesting thing about intuition, and it makes mm -hmm. me think of you. He says, "What is called intuition is simply a result of intensive." pertinent functioning of the oral imagination. <laughs> this has nothing to do with rationality in an analytical sense. And, um, well, but I think that intuition is learned. I mean, I think that, that you develop your intuition. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you have to start with trying to understand what you understand. Uh, and then, but once, then you can develop that. So uh, I don't think intuition is magic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I, on the other hand, I think you can. Uh, I would disagree with that in that I think you can, you can uh, uh, examine, probe, for the nature of a person's musical intuition. Um, yeah, I had a question about that. You you already brought it up. Yeah. yeah uh, and I think uh, sometimes intuition. I said this once, and somebody got very upset. I think. Uh, the word and the notion is sometimes used as a garbage can. <laughs> I mean, you can you attribute something to intuition, and then you don't have to say anymore. Right. Um, but I think uh, I think the as far as education and learning and all of that is concerned, it's critical to to uh, try to understand what it is that people know how to do without anybody teaching it to them. <clears throat> so um, Sessions wrote music that could be described as challenging to listen to and he <laughs> saw it as coming from a creative vision not to be difficult or avant-garde for its own sake. Um, did, he, um, did he talk about the issues of, of, um, of um, you know, music such as his um, and even among musicians being able to, you know, it, it, even musicians found you know, that very challenging. Did he talk about those kinds of issues and that whole process and what was happening with those kinds of composers? Not per se, because he was, just as, as he was in the Eroica Symphony, he was in the piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the fact that it was difficult well the Eroica Symphony is difficult too mm -hmm. and I think that was was more the the approach it's just that 
when we listen to Beethoven, we don't hear why it's difficult. Right. Uh, it doesn't seem to be difficult because we're not really hearing what's going on, all of the, all that's going on in the piece. Uh, in fact, you know, I, when people ask me what I do, I, 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 uh, one of the things I say, quip, is um, I'm interested in helping people to hear the complexity in a complex piece of music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, the fact that it's that people have trouble with it is simply because they're listening to style. <laughs> if you want, I mean, they're they're um, they're they're waiting for the resolution. They're waiting for the chromaticism to resolve, uh, and they're missing the whole point. Did he talk about um, serialism and you know? Um I mean, Weber, and, but also later on, you know, Lu Luigi Nono and Stockhausen and Boulez. Did he talk about that? Well, he was, he claimed that he was, he wasn't a 12 tone composer, right. and he was, uh, he insisted on that. Um, but I think that his attitude towards, towards it was the 12 tone part of it and doing serial analysis and so forth, that wasn't what was interesting. Um, the, the, it was, it was what the piece shares with mm -hmm. complex pieces uh, of, uh, in any style. Yeah. That, that was uh, was the point. Of course, when we <laughs> we did the fourth quartet and then the Bartok quartet, it was almost as if this was to show the greatness of Schoenberg and the less greatness of of Bartok. But the but Bartok was already much better than Stravinsky. <laughs> He also had a thing about um, national style. Wait, I just remember we did the, move, the symphony in three movements of Stravinsky. Uh -huh. Those were the three pieces. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that some of the problem he had with, with Bartok was the the kind of Hungarianness of it? I don't think so because we used to talk about uh, the difference between uh, people who wrote ethnic music borrowing mm -hmm. and uh, in contrast to well, somewhere the, the notion of renting a house instead of living in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, uh, no, I don't think it was the fact that he was using folk songs or mm -hmm. something. But um, it was just, because what was it, what's important is what people do with their right. material. So, so he had a kind of a, a preference to uh, Schoenberg to... Um, to Bartok and certainly to Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Um, we can't get through this next next topic now, but um, um, let's um, let's see what we can do. Um, <laughs> your master's degree, and we've talked about some of the stuff you've already done at yeah. at, at, um, at Berkeley. Um, you mentioned your your master's degree was on on um, Krennic's um, piano sonatas. Four right? sonatas, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, did you also study um, piano when you were at the university there? No, uh -huh. not at all. I just played a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was, was that your first experience playing contemporary music? Yeah. 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 And that was really sessions pushed me into that. Mm -hmm. How was that for you? Was it something you really wanted to do, or did yeah? Oh, I, 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 I was very excited about mm -hmm. about learning learning that music and playing it, and I think the fact that they were all right there, yeah. Um, so it was it was really like being that was where I got the idea that I wanted what I wanted to be was a community musician, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was because that's really what I was there. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, and it, it was really was the only time when uh, you know there was a whole group of people and we were all uh, involved with this stuff and and I was playing it not the only one of yeah. course but uh, along with others so you played the piano part in Schoenberg's Ode to Napoleon with the Barati Chamber Orchestra <laughs> yes. in San Francisco how did that come about well, we were just talking about that last night um, uh, Somebody in the orchestra must have suggested it. I don't. Uh, I don't remember how it came about. I was asked if I wanted to do it. And, uh -huh. um, 
Did you know um, George Barati? Well, I think he was around because he was a composer, and mm -hmm. uh, he was kind of part of the crew. That uh, although he was he was older, and he was and he was playing a lot of the music that people were composing. So mm -hmm. uh, he was. I don't know if I'm pre pretty sure I had met him before, but you know the fact that I was playing all of this stuff. And so you were kind of known out there as a pianist that could do it. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, George Perotti, his dates are 1913, 1996. He taught cello at Princeton University yes. and studied with Sessions there. Right. Uh, and so I that probably, yeah. right, I knew he was a cellist. But yeah. that was all a very funny thing because um, I was taking a course from David Boyden on the Mozart string quartets, and the exam... Uh, was scheduled at the same time as a rehearsal with the, of the Ode to Napoleon. So I asked Boyden if I could take the exam before or after or some other time. He said, you're going to have to make up your mind whether you're a student at the university or you're a pianist. <laughs> wow. 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 <laughs> also, I had never played in an orchestra as an instrumentalist in mm -hmm. an orchestra, and mm -hmm. that was a whole new experience. Wow. Who were some of your other um, other students, you know, colleagues at the, at the university there, and did you have, did you talk about, you know, contemporary music much, or did you, oh, you just... Oh, yeah. We were deep into it all yeah. the time. Leland Smith was probably my best friend. He's, mm -hmm. the, you know, he, he was at Stanford, he yeah. retired. But he was, he's the guy who did score. Right. Um, he and his wife were probably my closest friends. And then, I don't know, there was a, um, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Rosen, not Charles, Charles not Charles. Yeah. That's another story. Um, ah, can't think of his first name, goodness. Um, he's at UC Davis. Um, and then there was, ah, I can't remember his name either, um, but I'll think of it. The guy who wrote the music for, he became a, mo a movie composer, um, and he wrote the music for the uh, James Dean movies, he became mm. famous for that. Mm. Um, I'll think of his name. Um, so there was a whole group of people who were, uh, I was mostly, uh, it was the composers that mm -hmm. I was hanging around with, and we were, uh, but it was the first time that I had been around people who were talking about music and playing music and doing all of that. Also, Vincent Duckles was a oh, close friend. No kidding. <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. In fact, I kind of, they kind of adopted me. I gave piano lessons to their kids, and, and Madeline, who's now over 90, his wife, mm -hmm. is still very active and very much around and was involved with the new, there's a new music building, a, a new building, oh. um, uh -huh. a whole music library building that's just been opened. Oh, I've heard and about it's that. That's dedicated. Right. It's yeah. named after Vincent. Mm -hmm. Oh, rightfully so. Yeah. I know that at various universities among composition students um, in, the, in the past there were lots of debates about 12-tone music and the way that it became kind of institutionalized. Um, was that an issue there? Well, it wasn't an issue because it was not institutionalized. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was not looked upon as, as some kind of panacea. Mm -hmm. It was, it was um, and I don't think that there, I don't remember, certainly none of the pieces that I played were 12-tone. Mm -hmm. um, and the students of Sessions were not writing 12-tone music. Yeah. Um, and that meant that they had to really work hard to find how to be not tonal. They had to find their own, uh, their own um, voice, yeah. voice or whatever you call it. Um, yeah, there were a bunch of others too whose names I will come up with eventually. At your performance of Ode to Napoleon, was Schoenberg there possibly? No. No, no he was already pretty pretty old, but I, I did go to see him. Uh-huh. Want to tell me about that? Uh, 
Well, that was also because of David Boyden in a way. I wanted to write my thesis on the sonata form in atonal music. Uh-huh. And David Boyden said that was by definition impossible. <laughs> well, but there are all those pieces that are in sonata form, like the lyric suite comes yeah. to mind. Okay, so I said, I'm going to go and ask Schoenberg about it. So Roger arranged for me to uh, go and talk to him. And um, it happened that, I mean, this must have been in 1950 or something like that, 49 or 50. Uh, and if there was a big Schoenberg, all Schoenberg concert in Los Angeles celebrating his, what, 75th birthday? Would that be? Uh, something like yeah, that. Right. Yeah, right. Okay. So I went to the concert, and um, uh, at the intermission, Nuria, his daughter, came out on the stage, thanked everybody for coming and for the concert, and apologized that her father wasn't feeling well enough to come. Okay. The next morning, I went to visit Schnau- uh, uh, Schoenberg. They're all S's, aren't they? I went to visit Schoenberg, and while we were talking, the vacuum is cleaner is going all the time. And finally he apologized, and he said that Ronnie, his son, had put Nuria up to making that speech, that she wasn't asked to do that, she wasn't told to do that, and she shouldn't have done that, and so she was being punished by having to vacuum the whole house. (laughs) Um, Anyhow, he was totally livid at the idea that that there couldn't be sonata form in in atonal music. and then he went off on, on how, how horribly his pieces are performed, and that's why nobody likes them, because the performances are so bad. And, um, and he was quite cuckoo. I mean, he, was, he looked wild. Uh, and also in the midst of it, um, Dick Hoffman, who was, is some, some way related to him, Richard Hoffman. Uh-huh. Oh, um, the composer. The composer. Yeah. Um, he was, he came every morning and went through the mail and organized things. The mail arrival was the oh, big Oh, that's right. Event. He was kind of an, an assistant to him and, and he was. cleaned right. up his archives after he died and yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. He was there doing that. Right. Um, so that was the, that was the visitation with Schoenberg. After that, I, I became quite friendly with his daughter, Nuria. We used to play tennis. Um. So, so what more did he say about sonata form in in atonal music? That well, I can't. I, he sort of began just railing about oh, everything, uh-huh. but uh, it, it, what he said was so, it wasn't a matter of the tonic and the dominant, but a matter of contrast. Mm-hmm. And there were lots of ways to make contrast, mm-hmm. and that it was stupid of anybody to think that that uh, that that was the essence of sonata form was the, uh, the the tonal areas right. that it was the um, it was the structural contrast that was mm-hmm. important so uh, but then I so what did David Boyden say of that after you came back and reported well I think by that time I was hardly talking to him <laughs> I was through with that but there was a problem also with book officer uh-huh. um uh because I didn't have enough footnotes, and I didn't, I had, uh, I said things, and I didn't say where they came from. This was after the whole uh, thesis was typed and ready to go, and I'd been working on it, of course, with, with Sessions. And Sessions and Book Officer shared an office. And I always used to say that if, if, Sesh, if Book Officer didn't smoke his cigar, and Roger didn't smoke his pipe, so that there was a great lot of smoke between them. They would have, I don't know, fought. They would have beat each other up or something. Uh, but uh, so book officer made me put things in like um, private conversation with the composer, um, and because uh, I had the whole interest in the. That goes back to a question you asked before. But one of the interests that I had in doing it was was this change in style. 
and the four piano sonatas mm -hmm. cover the whole uh, uh, the change. Um, and so I was trying to account for this change in style um, by what was going on politically and uh, where he was moving and, and what was going on musically, politically, and book officer didn't want to have any of that because I couldn't document it. <laughs> so I had to put in these footnotes and I had to rewrite the, the thesis. Uh, and finally, and I, I, in the meantime, I'd gotten the Fulbright and was leaving and I was finished so I had to find somebody to type this new version uh, in uh, quickly and so I ran into book officer as she was working on it and he said well how's it going and I said oh she's great she's really fast and he said he said speed does not ensure accuracy <laughs> wow. so <laughs> Okay. So um, I think we can end there and we'll start with your um, Fulbright scholarship um, and studying with Missy and next time. Okay. Then your career at MIT and lots of <laughs> lots of things. Okay. Um, thank you so much for, okay. for coming today. Well, it's all very interesting. <laughs>